So we really appreciate everyone coming today to learn about exploring population health and our experiences in the United Kingdom this last May. And I have to say the weather outside today was like the hottest day that we had in London. Uh, we had perfect weather when we were there. I mean, I think it drizzled one day, but, but other than that, we had really, really great weather. And what a great place to go to learn about public health and the history of public health and uh, why public health is so important. Because, you know, learning about what happened in Victorian England and, and how important just really primary public health measures are in keeping a community safe and healthy, um, we, we saw some of that um, firsthand and got to learn from some real experts in the field about that. So before I pass off to um, our students, I just want everybody to um, give everybody a kind of a history of this course. It's PUH 496 and 696, Exploring Population Health. And we go different places. And, um, you know, really this, this is an education abroad course. So if you're interested in education abroad, you have to go to the like, education abroad website to apply for these courses. And if you're interested in what we're planning for next year, uh, Mina Nabavi or I can help you navigate that to figure out how to uh, apply. Uh, but really what this course does is provide students an opportunity to learn about both historical and contemporary public health issues, their effects on population health, and how public health systems are working to solve these issues in, in communities today. And I think we got a lot of that when we were there. Um, so I hope y'all think so. Uh, but that was our, our real goal. So previous locations before the UK, uh, Mina and I traveled with a group of students around the deep south, a two-week bus, bus trip here in the uh, uh, southeast United States. Uh, in 2019, we went to Panama. And summer of 2018, we were actually scheduled to go to the UK, but it had to be put on hold because of COVID. But we really swiftly kind of pivoted that course and did it online, but we focused on what was going on with COVID-19 around the world and what uh, actions people around the world were taking to kind of mitigate the effects of COVID-19 in the populations that they, they were responsible for. Um, and then, of course, this course in the United Kingdom. So this course has um, things that students work together to define. Um, Cassidy, in a minute, is going to tell you a little bit about what we did before we traveled. But they had some readings they had to read. And really, the class came up with these class definitions for population health, social determinants of health, and health equity. And as we were visiting different sites, whether they were historical sites, whether they were community-based organizations or universities and hearing different presentations, I asked students to think about these things and to reflect on these things from, you know, for what they were learning for that day and how do they all uh, apply to these things and uh, other things that we discussed in the course, which I think Jonathan is going to tell you a little bit more about at the end. So here's the timeline. This was a May mini term course. Um, we started on May 9th. We did about 20 hours in the classroom before we traveled uh, over two and a half days. Uh, and then on the, the um, fourth day, we got on an airplane and left for the UK. And we were in the UK for through to May 24. We had eight days in London and then three days in Aberystwyth. And then there were two additional days where we were traveling from London to Aber and then Aber back to, to London. Um, so we had a, a, a pretty extensive time in country. Here is a picture of this, uh, the group that went to the UK. We had 14 students that were undergraduate, master, doctoral, and certificate um, um, course um, students. Um, majors included not only public health, but medical sociology, biomedical sciences, neuroscience, 
health education and promotion. And within public health, we had people representing environmental health sciences, health behavior, and our population health disciplines. So now I am going to pass it to Cassidy Stoddard, who is going to come talk about what we did before we traveled. Hi everyone, I'm Cassidy Stoddard. I'm a junior here at UAB, majoring in sociology. Um, so I'll be touching on the pre travel orientation. So we spent like three days building, kind of prepping for our objectives and our goals for what, what we should prep for um, when comparing the UK versus the US in terms of like healthcare. Um, so we first start with Dr. Meredith's presentation, and it was on cultural and cultural competency. Um, and so she talked about her own experience. Um, in non-traditional medicine and Western medicine treatment um, from her own personal experience. Um, and with like, in a non-traditional way, he talked about like spiritual guidance was a way of being treated um, illnesses uh, versus in the Western, the first way of treating like a, it, like a sickness is like going to the doctors and getting prescriptions. Um, then we talked about the pathways program and they aim to, they. More or less, just talked about what they defined as homelessness, um, especially in women and children. Um, and then I moved on to environmental discrimination. Um, we focused on Uniontown in Alabama, um, and they talked about how they had less access to um, um, just inequality in the African American communities in rural areas. Um, and then I moved on to the 1977 clinic and then the AIDS outreach visit. Um, and we touched on HIV awareness, especially in the LGBTQIA um, and, um, group, um, as well as they have like a center. I think it was like the first center for um, the academy, like first in like the US. So that was really impressive to see that in person. Um, and then on our last day, we did presentation, so we're split up into our own little groups, and we touch on different aspects between comparing the UK versus the US. I believe my group we touched on the historical aspect of things, um, and how they treated current illnesses, um, and as well as care care um providing. Um, and then we did a built environment assessment. This is my first time doing this; I've never heard this before, and I was like, "Built environment? Are we like building something?" Um, but no, we just walked around the south side, kind of near um, the barbecue place. It's behind like Blunt and Rast Hall. And we just took note of like basically almost like a scale of like, is this a poor, fair, or excellent condition? Um, kind of look at how like sidewalks, but the sidewalk condition was, as well as like if there was room to walk, if there was cracks in the road, um, if there was like a, in the, an intersection day at like cross walks even. Um, it kind of changed my perspective of like walking around. Um, we're all like doing mini built environment assessments now, and they're like crossing the street now. Um, and then we also did journaling every single day on what we've learned. Um, and yeah, I can move on to what I was doing day one. Hello, everyone. My name is Jane Vines, and I'm a graduate student and a Master of Public Health. I'm working on a concentration in population health as well as a graduate certificate in global health. Um, so first day we arrived, um, so we flew all through uh, the night um, on Thursday, and we arrived around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning on Friday, and so we just kind of powered through our jet lag, and we were whisked away on a guided bus tour that kind of took us to some very important historical sites. Um, we saw both of them pilots, we saw them preparing for the um, Platinum Jubilee, which was going to be only a few weeks after our trip. Um, we had a wonderful guide who told us all about uh, the historical significance of a lot of the different places we visited, even just driving by and kind of pointing out some different buildings and kind of where they fit into the history. Um, we had the ideal uh, telephone booth, which us every time we saw one was amazing, but there they're kind of everywhere. Um, so our second day, we got all rested up, and so we spent the day exploring, um, following in the footsteps of. Um, the, uh, of John Snow, who is known as the father of epidemiology. And so that involved a couple of different things. We visited the, um, I can't remember, it's the London College of Royal College of Physicians. Royal College of Physicians. And we got a tour kind of understanding some of the history of the Royal College of Physicians. One very interesting part of it was our speaker who talked a lot about the link between tobacco smoking and lung cancer. So us today, that seems like, that doesn't seem like a mystery at all. But back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, there was a lot of unknowns. 
So he really spoke to a lot how vigorous research is important in order to really make changes in the, in the community. So as we see now, if you're in the hospital, your, your physician will not be smoking while he's talking to you. Back in the 60s and 70s, this was not the case. So we can really see how these type of initiatives really do improve and change public health. So walking through the streets of um, London, we kind of walked down many places and we were told there's, you know, there's historical significance. And of course, the most significant historical site is the Bradbury Pump. This is a this is with a, uh, a remake of the pump, but it stands in the same place the original pump would have stood and does actually also give water. But this shows a lot of humans in the very first epidemiological map that was created and also really increased the field of epidemiology um, within the field of public health. And very interesting to note, because although we know about Jon Snow and we kind of herald him as his father of epidemiology in his own time, he really wasn't considered that significant. He, you know, he did stop this, this epidemic, but otherwise he kind of faded in um, Kind of to the walls of history, and he actually died only a few years later and was not really known for anything significant until many, many years later. His research and his work was duplicated, and we really saw how this can help with disease outbreaks and what we use today. So, with that, I'm going to pass this along to Portia. Hello, everyone. My name is Portia Edwards. I am a recent public health uh, graduate, um, undergraduate um alumni and on day three we basically visited the one of the world's uh, oldest national museums in london also called the british museum which was originally founded in 1753 by sir hans salon uh this museum um is home to the famous rosetta stone like hillary uh hollywood Egyptian mummies, et cetera. Like anything that you learn when you was uh, in your history courses, um, you can pretty much find it here at this museum. Upon arriving uh, to the museum, to the museum, uh, we were asked to do a scavenger hunt in which we found five items that were related to public health as well as our course themes. Uh, the museum has like over 70 exhibits from different regions and continents. And so basically given that how large and in depth this museum was uh, during our four hour visit, we were not able to uh, visit every location, but we really enjoyed our time there. Um, after we uh, finished with our scavenger hunt, we basically gathered for high tea, which is also located inside of the museum. Uh, it's um, at the great restaurant that they, that they have. Um, basically this term high tea was introduced in the 1840s uh, by Duchess uh, Bedford. Her name was Anna Maria Russell. And so basically this was just a time to enjoy high tea which typically took place in the afternoon. Um, if you're basically, if you're curious, high tea was a, a place where you could have biscuits and jams and finger sandwiches and scones and delicate cakes, as you see here on the photo above. Um, basically, and it was all, it was a great experience because even those with dietary restrictions still could be accommodated um, at this restaurant. Next slide. And this basically is just a slide to just show you all some of the items that we have found. Um, basically, um, so if you all are interested, um, if you all are interested, we have our blog at the end of the at the end of this presentation that you'll be able to go on there and to be able to go get more information about it, as well as you can go to the British uh, Museum website as well. Thank you. Barcha is on active duty right now, so we really appreciate her being able to sign in. So, yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'll be kind of walking you through what we did on day four, where we visited the Queen's Nursing Institute. And so this was actually established in 1887 by Florence Nightingale and has been continued in its use ever since. And so at the Queen's Nursing Institute, um, they focus on this model of community nursing, which is something very different than what we see in the U.S., so um, in the UK, uh, general practitioners and nurses will work with the communities um, to provide that base level of care. And then um, from their specializations or being, you know, if you have a particular kind of um, health issue, then you can move on to a specialist. So the actual structure of the UK health system with the NHS is very different um, from the US, which is one thing that we learned. Um, 
but we actually got that initial walkthrough of the role of community nursing um, from the uh, chief executive, Dr. Crystal Olman, who, fun fact, is also um, CBE, which is commander of the British Empire. So it's a very special distinction given to someone who's made um, an extreme contribution in their field. So fun fact, she has that really awesome um, designation and distinction. And so to kind of dive more into what is community nursing and what does that really look like, we heard from staff member Kendra Schneller, um, who walked us through what community nursing looks like in uh, addressing homelessness in London's 32 boroughs. So with regards to unhoused individuals, um, and thinking back to what we learned in our pre-travel coursework, um, the definition for what it meant to be unhoused and to qualify for the kind of, um, I guess the aid that you would receive, you know, public health wise, um, that kind of stuff is actually very different in the UK. So they had a much broader definition than what we had in the US. So that was something interesting to note. Um, and so these nurses um, really go out into the communities and work with all individuals, um, including the unhoused from what they termed as sperm to, or no, worm to sperm, or no, something something like that. They had this sperm little term, to worm. sperm to worm. So from <laughs> when you have conception to you're done, um, pretty much they are there for every step of the way. So they are kind of the first line um, people that you will work with. Um, so that was one thing that we explored was one particular difference um, in the US and the UK, which was what does it mean to be unhoused and to receive that kind of aid um, especially in a public health sense of being um, provided for. Um, and then we also heard from professional nurse advocate Rebecca Daniels on this really new initiative that they have with regards to prioritizing self-care and wellness for these community nurses um, and nurses as a whole. And so this is kind of response to COVID-19 that we've seen, as well as just a general observation of how stressful the work environment can be for nurses. Um, so this is something that we kind of recognized was very similar between the US and the UK in terms of burnout and the sense of resilience that has to be developed and cultivated in the workforce and how can we make sure that people also feel comfortable being vulnerable um, and unpacking some of those more difficult patient encounters that do occur. So that was very, very cool to hear just because um, we've yet to see something like that develop in the US on a major scale. And so this is something that's kind of going on um, in its first steps in the UK. So hopefully we can see that come to fruition and maybe even learn from that and take it back home. And then after visiting the Q&A, um, we had a lunch where we um, ate some Mexican food, but one thing that was noticed was actually the, de the decreased salt usage. And so an interesting thing to note, so as a whole, the UK would have generally less salt used in um, their foods. And this is just due to UK health policy initiatives to decrease this public health issue of hypertension that they noticed. And this policy has been effective um, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are on it, but it has been proven to um, decrease that rate of hypertension that they were starting to see climb in the early 2000s. So maybe that's something that we can also bring back with us and uh, implement in the US. And I will now pass it on for our day five speaker. Hello everyone, I'm Grace Albright. I'm a doctoral student in developmental psychology, also pursuing an interdisciplinary master's in public health and social statistics. Um, on the first, or sorry, the fifth day, we visited the UK's oldest HIV and sexual health charity, the Terence Higgins Trust. Uh, the trust was established by the friends and family of Terence Higgins, who unfortunately passed away from AIDS-related health complications over 40 years ago. Since its establishment, the trust has grown to serve communities across the UK, and as stated, recently celebrated 40 years of service to the community. We learned about some of the UK's primary health goals for HIV, which includes the 95-95-95 target, meaning that by 2030, 95% of those living with HIV are diagnosed, 95% of those diagnosed are receiving treatment, and 95% of individuals in treatment have an undetectable viral load. Um, but by 2022, the UK is currently on track to meet this target um, and actually surpass it, with current reported levels showing 95% diagnosed, 99% in treatment, and 97% with an undetectable viral load. However, it's important to keep in mind that the numbers do not always tell the full story. The trust pours much of their effort into fighting stigma surrounding sexual health through advocacy and bringing a voice to those unable or too afraid to speak for themselves. They are also actively working to reach underserved areas and populations across the UK because much of the work surrounding HIV and sexual health has been limited to the London area. 
And finally, the trust is instrumental in the UK's National HIV Testing Week campaign, Give HIV the Finger, which encourages individuals to get tested for HIV. All it takes is one finger prick. Later that day, we met up with UAB MPH alum Stacy June Shelton, who currently serves as the Global Head of Education and Advocacy for the Dove Self-Esteem Project at Unilever. We met at the Unilever headquarters to discuss and learn more about the Self-Esteem Project, which is a global outreach effort that spans multiple countries across the globe. The project encompasses a wide variety of initiatives targeting individuals aged 7 to 24 focused on building self-esteem and body confidence. We discussed our own formative years and how impactful it would have been to be exposed to media that acknowledges and promotes varied outlooks on both inner and diverse beauty. In order to disarm toxic beauty standards, um, a dramatic change in beauty standards, ideals, marketing, as well as general thought processes must take place. This includes a shift in media practices, as well as policies and practices of both government and non-government entities. Dove has a long-standing mission, which is to make beauty accessible to all women. And they're doing so in many ways, especially through their work reframing beauty ideals to be inclusive and realistic. Um, it was really a privilege to spend time with Stacy and also to see what a public health career looks like within a corporate setting. Hi, I'm Ellie Marie Humphreys. I am a doctorate student in health education and promotion um, from across campus. Um, so I'm going to cover day um, our time in Abbotsworth. Um, the second portion of our trip was actually where we took a train to the seaside town of Abbotsworth, and it's located um, in a seaside town of um, Wales. It's one of the largest town in Wales and features a one mile long promenade along the sea. And then at the northern end of it, when you are on the promenade, they have a what they call Constitution Hill, and it's 430 feet above sea level. And when you get to the top, you can basically see the entire town um, from both the seaside all the way up to where the university sits on top of the hill. Um, while we were visiting there, we were um, given the opportunity to meet with multiple faculty and staff and researchers and community members in Aberystwyth to learn about different initiatives as it resulted with um, public health, but also some of the other outside of fields of like agriculture and what that means, as well as um, different types of chronic health um, studies. So the first full day that we were there, we actually had two faculty members doing the research present, and then we also got to visit the National Library of Wales. So the first presentation we had was with Dr. Thatcher, and Dr. Thatcher's work really looked at the relationship between um, active, physical activity and chronic diseases and how that works together. And throughout his entire presentation, he was actually doing a glucose monitoring so every like hour or every 30 minutes, he was making a note of like where um, his glucose levels were at. Um, a really big takeaway that I got from his presentation was um, the concept of how we look at language around talking about physical activity versus exercise. Um, he pretty much emphasized that the way that we talk about physical activity versus exercise can actually alienate people from engaging in preventative measures for chronic diseases such as um, diabetes. Um, and if we can reframe the way that we talk about these things, it might actually encourage more engagement from community members rather than alienating people from feeling, for example, feeling like they have to exercise to maintain a healthy lifestyle when Physical activity, it can always, it could be enough too, because it's the same thing. If you're walking down the street for 30 minutes every day, that's the same thing as getting what we would consider exercise. Um, so that was really, I found it to be extremely insightful and helpful um, when thinking about language and how that influences health behaviors. The second presentation was from Dr. Rachel Rahman, and she actually talked about telehealth. And a really interesting takeaway from her presentation was how much of it reflected what we experience here in Alabama within our rural communities with telehealth. Um, her experiment kind of like got pushed to the forefront with COVID and looking at how telehealth services would either benefit or not be utilized by people because the majority of Wales um, population lives in a rural community. And she actually 
shared some of her results and found that a lot of people benefited from it and had like a positive interaction with it and utilized the services, but it also reflected some of the, the holes that have yet to be truly filled when it comes to telehealth, because there's also the implications of access to internet and computers and how it can actually alienate some people from it if they don't have those services readily available. Um, but it was a very um, interesting presentation because, as I said, in Alabama, that's something that we've been continuously exploring with telehealth medicine and what that actually looks like when it comes to rural communities. So I really did appreciate her presentation. Um, the last part of the first day, we went to the National Library of Wales, and personally, that was my favorite part um, because we got to, one, get a presentation on the history of Wales and why when you are in Wales, everything is either in, it's in Welsh and in English. Um, and it's part of a, a larger initiative to preserve and celebrate Welsh history and culture and the language of it. And our guide at the library was um, Dr. or Mr. Graves, and he provided that overview, but then also led us down into the multi-level archival system that was below um, the main floor of the library. Um, and that was really interesting because they had everything from family portraits to newspaper clippings, a 15th century copy of Chaucer's um, Canterbury Tales, um, and it was all in Welsh. And the main purpose of all of this was to preserve Welsh history and culture. Um, and so basically, if you were an individual with Welsh connections you, and you had family photos from your family at some point in history, um, you could submit it and they would put it in the archival system and that's where it would stay from now and until. I mean, it was really cool to see it because the extensive formats of the mm -hmm. items that they had stored was incredible to see and also learning about the different steps to take to make things um, last. Archiving books is not an easy task of so the temperature regulations, fire regulations. We got to learn about all those things. And um, before the end of it, he shared about like the relationship between Wales and Birmingham, Alabama. And so in the 60s, um, John Pett, um, an artist, was in, not necessarily inspired, but he was extremely like emotionally moved by the bombing on the 16th Street Baptist Church and from, used that as the motivation to create the stained glass window designs. Um, to kind of honor the loss of lives, but also to highlight the racial disparities that were occurring over here in Alabama. Um, and the people of Wales were the ones to fund the money for it. So he sourced it from multiple community members throughout Wales to pay for it. Um, and it has since been moved back to Wales and it, I think it celebrated its 50th year um, where there's still um, conversation being held on how to continue that preservation of it and celebration of that piece of artwork. And the side glass is still in the 16th Street Baptist mm -hmm. Church. And uh, the designs are in Wales, but the physical windows, and there's been, I was reading an article not too long ago about how there's concerns about the weather in Alabama potentially causing damage to it. And so they are having conversations and trying to like troubleshoot how to protect the windows from any kind of like natural disasters or anything like that. So on the second full day that we were in Aberystwyth, we um, had two more presentations by researchers and then a visit to a local nonprofit. Uh, the first presentation that we had was Professor Ball Brewer and his research and his main focus of his presentation was talking about the contamination of metals from um, prior mining. And he was finding through research that there were extremely large concentrations of metals found in the soil miles away from the original mining sites and that was contributed to heavy rainfall in the area. And the consequence of those metals being found in the environment was actually impacting agricultural landscape. So that would include like crops, um, cattle eating the grass, and then the cattle being then consumed for um, human consumption. Um, and being able to trace the contamination and the eventual um, dangers of consuming those type of materials and metals. And so his work looked at that and how really our environment is a direct 
impact on how our quality of life is, but also our general health. And if we're not taking care of the environment and looking at how previous behaviors and industrialization um, impacts our environment, we're not going to be able to really take true precautions to future health concerns. The second presentation was by Dr. Daryl Abernathy, and his work as a veterinarian, he obviously was very big into animals, um, and you could tell him and his presence was very vibrant when it came to talking about his work and research, um, and a really big focus of his presentation was on the black and white rhinos in Africa, and he shared about the relationship of animal health to public health, um, and a big one being with the rhinos that they were trying to look at ways for conservation purposes to help revive the population um, because they were verging on extinction. And a big issue that they ended up coming um, up against was the communities and tribes surrounding where the populations typically inhabited were experiencing extremely low quality of life and socioeconomic challenges. And despite whatever their conservation efforts were, if the people in the community were not able to truly um, subscribe to what they were trying to do conservation wise because they had to, they were worried about their own safety and basic needs. Um, and so that highlighted a lot of how, if we're going to work on again environmental issues, we also have to think about whole picture holistically, like what, what is the reality of the people that are being. Um, impacted or in the surrounding areas of wildlife. For the last activity that we did um, on this on day seven, we met with Aber Food Supply or Su Surplus, and it is a not for profit organization that provides food services to people in the community. And a big thing for them is striving to reduce the amount of food waste that the community experiences, but also um, expanding the access to nutritious food and providing education services for people to learn how to engage with food in a healthy way. Um, they work with local businesses, restaurants, and through other partnerships and donations to fulfill their orders. Um, and when we were talking to the director of it, she shared that they can they feed up to 270 community members a week um, with the items that they're receiving in addition to providing the food, but they also provide the service of teaching people what to do with that food. Yeah, you because know, you can just because you provide tomatoes doesn't mean that somebody's going to necessarily know what to do with those tomatoes. So that could even go from um, how to preserve it through canning or even like what kind of dishes you can include with it. Um, and so that was really interesting because we have some nonprofits throughout the United States that do that. Um, but the component of actually providing like the application of what they're providing as a service is really important. And I think that's what is a big difference between having an urban farm here in Alabama versus Aberfruit surplus. Um, they're fixing all the components where we might only have like one component of just providing the food. Hi everyone, my name is Roshana. I'm a public health undergrad. Um, it's my junior year. But to go off of day eight, this is the Tower of London. Um, this was kind of more like historical laid back day. Um, I really enjoyed this tour because it was really like immersive and historical experience of England. This is shows like when you think about the monarchy, think about just Buckingham Palace, or at least I do. Um, but this really shows like what it was before that. Um, we had some really cool, we saw some really cool things like saw some execution sites of a lot of famous queens like Anne Boleyn. Um, and we were like literally two feet away from the crown jewels. I see them on TV now and I'm like, I could have touched you. It's really <laughs> close. <laughs> um, but this was a really good day. We had a really nice tour guide um, to show us around. And it was just really a, like a nice experience seeing everything from like how it used to be in the ancient monarchy and the ancient like in those times where the British Empire really ruled the world and to see how they lived in their capital city. Mm -hmm. But after the London uh, the London Tower, we went to the Wellcome Collection, which is in honor of Henry Wellcome, who was an American British pharmaceutical entrepreneur um, who really set down his company in England and was very successful. And when he died in his will, um, he kind of understood how health only progresses through health research. Um, and his main goal in his whole career um, was to kind of push health forward um, in, in terms of like hygiene, sanitation, in terms of like educating people. So the Welcome Center really honors his legacy in his life. And um, they always have exhibits up about pressing human crises. So when we went, it was air, 
uh, the human being human and the medicine man. Um, I really liked the air exhibition. It showed about how climate change is really a pressing issue. Um, and a lot of pieces that were shown really impactful. Uh, there were like different mediums, you could put headsets on and watch a video um, or, or something like this, how even space, like how they're saying our pollution is reaching like even beyond our planet. Um, and the being human was really interesting because I felt like the exhibitions that were shown there or the pieces that were shown in that exhibition, exhibition kind of made it seem like there was a certain magic to the human body, kind of how everything like somehow works in unison to make us. Um, and the medicine man was kind of in honor of Henry Welcome. Um, and just kind of his career and his life, but that was a welcome collection. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Maya Zipper. I'm an undergrad in public health. Um, so overall, this two-week immersive and intensive program in the UK truly helped us as a group learn about population health and how the UK differs from the states. Um, as you can tell, our journey started way before we even stepped off the plane. Our guest speakers here at UAB set a foundation and helped us define our key terms that we would henceforth re uh, reflect on. Um, the course definitely kept us busy, and special thanks to Dr. Lisa McCormick and Lena Habadi for putting together this um, itinerary. It helped us, um, it not only provided valuable information, but also memorable experiences. There were many activities that spiked everyone's interest in different ways. Um, and helped us shape our future goals and what we would like to do with our careers. Um, we learned from many program directors, historians, public health advocates, um, professors in Aberystwyth, and even the chance to talk with the UAB alumni. Um, each night, we had to, time to reflect on everything that we learned in the process. Um, so I would definitely participate in this course again, and I recommend it to you, everyone in my class, and of course, and the chance I get to brag about being in the UK, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, this class was my first experience out of the traditional classroom learning about public health. So it helped me gain hands-on experience and to be able to interact with other communities and bring those lessons home to present to everyone here. Um, and also we can't not mention the queen, um, us being able to show our respects to her and we were lucky enough to be in the United Kingdom during the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. So that was definitely an experience that we all remember. So you thought we were done, but we're not done yet. So what did so we had to blog as part of our courses this um during this time. Um so part of our blogging was one of our assignment video. Of course, this was a course work, so we didn't have coursework through it all. So we Every day we were blogging, and then I think Jane and others had mentioned it a little bit. But each day we really were trying to bring back some valuable information back to people who are at home. So you can just, there's a link below here, and you can find this at, as a PH website. You can find the information as well. But just some highlights of this as well. Um, each day, of course, as everyone has highlighted pretty well. We all did, but there's just some great photos here we wanted to like just talk about. Of course, there's like the welcome collection, the water is live. Um, there's me signing the book in the John Snow Pub. Um, it's just, it was a really great experience. And we also wanted to kind of mention the word board at the bottom. So it was the, uh, the pump handle that John Snow um, miraculously figured out was part of the color epidemic that happened there. So just within our word board, we had just some ideas that we kind of thought was really empowering that we wanted to bring back with us here. Um, everything from U equals U, unexpectable equals untransmittable with HIV, to Tarwick, to Cuppa, and just like really just British things that we thought was really important. Um, we also have another video that Ms. Ritika Samat uh, made. So on this blog that we do have, we have a compilation of all of our reflections. And so we did these little short reflection videos in um, close to our hotel at a very quintessential um, London phone booth. London phone booth. Um, so you'll see all of our videos in front of there. And they were just little short snippets from all of us about what we most enjoyed or thought we learned from the most um, throughout this experience. And so I've compiled a significantly shorter video. Um, so apologies, my editing is a little rough because I tried to keep it uh, timely, but if you'd like to see the full seven minute version, it is on the blog. And I realized I never introduced myself, but I'm a senior neuroscience major, but I'm also um, fast tracking the MPH. So that's where my public health kicks in.
So without any further ado, start this video. When we took a river cruise tour on River Thames, I appreciate all the work that they have done to make the river viable again after the cholera outbreak and the work that Jon Snow did and also being able to visit the Jon Snow pub and seeing everything that we learned about public health come full circle. Queens Nursing Institute, just looking at the way community nursing works here in London and how even though we do a lot of different things in the U.S. and the U.K., um, a lot of the same weaknesses uh, we do share. They showed us how even a public health system could have gaps and how they bridge those gaps with different programs and NGOs. Aberystwyth University, where they spoke about telehealth and I work in substance use disorder, so I was able to learn a lot about how they are utilizing telehealth in the United Kingdom and how it breaks across and reduces health inequities in terms of allowing more people to have access to tools that they wouldn't have otherwise. Hearing from Professor Daryl Abernathy who really brought to life the concept of One Health. Dr. Ross Thatcher discussed how the correlation between physical activity and diabetes correlate together and as a type 2 diabetic and a PhD student one of my dissertations it will be mental health and chronic illnesses so I learned a lot from Dr. Thatcher and I'm really really excited to take back what I learned to my um, PhD PhD program was visiting the Aber food surplus. It was very interesting to learn about the sustainable efforts they are making to address food insecurity in the Aberystwyth community. One of the things that Heather really said that really stuck out to me was we were built a salsa with her and we were eating the salsa and we felt bad about using two loaves of bread and she told us who is this food for if it's not for you because the food's for everyone. Talking with UAB alumni Stacy June who works with a Dove body body positivity campaign. Uh, when I was little, I was very much influenced by the Dove self-esteem campaign, so it was really cool to see the behind the scenes workings um, and see it also from a public health perspective. Um, I really enjoyed seeing how they intersect behavioral science as well as industry to develop their campaigns. On this trip, I think the most important thing that's really uh, brought a lot of impact to me was the Terrence Higgins Trust. They're the largest advocate for LGBTQ rights, especially those with HIV and AIDS here in the UK. Visiting the National Library of Wales, where we got to have a back behind the scenes tour of all the archival systems that have everything that has to do with Wales from history to print, television, and even some of the more recent um, artwork. It's the Welcome Collection. It depicts the whole evolution of human health. And I just love to see how the whole world of medicine and human health has evolved. And I'm Dr. Birthday Coast said, I apologize. I did not introduce myself. My name is Jonathan Baker. I am a senior here at School of Public Health with a minor in international studies. So this was kind of a perfect trip for me, merging a little bit. So I just wanted to tell everybody what we're planning for 2023. It's going to be a little bit different. We're not going to do this course in the main mini term next year, but we're going to do it in the in, in the last seven weeks of the fall 2023 term. We are planning to go to Cuba, and Dr. Paul Irwin, our dean of the School of Public Health, will be traveling with us. We plan to do seven weeks within the School of Public Health, you know, just meeting like one evening over the seven weeks to prepare to go to Cuba. And then we will travel uh, right after finals week. So December 9th through 17th of 2023. We're hoping that uh, we get all of this arranged and signups will begin early next semester, but we will put notices out when they do. So we hope people are interested in learning about public health and health care in Cuba and how that differs from what happens here in the U.S. and then traveling with us to Havana. <laughs> All right, so one last thing. Thanks everybody for coming. I have to ask, who knows the name of this flag? From day one of our trip, Dr. Aaron Hunter told y'all what the name of this flag was. I forgot. It's the Union. What is it? The Union Jack. The Union Jack. Why do they call it the, when can you call it the Union Jack? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, it's actually the Union flag, but. No, I will. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's the Union flag. You can only call it the Union Jack 
when it is on the bow of a Royal Naval vessel. Um, so when the Royal Navy is using it, uh, there's what they call a jack stand in the front on the bow, and that's when it is the Union Jack. But the Union flag uh, was developed when uh, England, Wales, and uh, Scotland became one United Kingdom, and then later when Northern Ireland was in the front. Well, thanks everybody for coming. That's all we have today. Y'all did a great job.